a lot of times artists will get caught up in this, oh my God, I, I, I have to make this sound because this is what's popping right now. And it's like, if you're starting to make that sound because that's what's going on right now, you're already too late. You yeah. have to make something that sounds authentic to you, that you feel like has staying power, because if not, you're just gonna be chasing trends and it's not really gonna help you in the long run. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Headliner Mindset Podcast. Today's guest is a really special one for me because this is the guy that gave me my first shot and helped me start my career in the dance music industry. He has worn almost every hat that you can, starting off working at a clothing brand, then throwing one of the most successful weekly parties in LA called Control, becoming an artist manager, which is where we linked up and worked together. He was even the general manager for Steve Angelo's label, Size Records, for a while, and now he runs a super successful creative and marketing agency called Super Evil Genius Corp, and they are working with some of the biggest DJs, bands, and festivals in the music industry. This is Ryan Jaso. My man, welcome to the show. I'm so pumped to have you here, brother. I'm very, very pumped to be here, so thank you for having me on. I'm pumped for a variety of different reasons. One, I know that the listeners are about to get so much fucking value from this episode <laughs> because you have had such a rad career in the music industry and specifically in the dance music industry from being a promoter, throwing shows, being a manager, developing acts, being a record label executive, now running a marketing company. Like you've almost done everything in the fucking business that you can do. So, we're about to go in, we're about to go deep, but for me personally, I am just so honestly honored to have you here and so excited because you are the guy that launched my career in the dance music industry. And so I just need to first start off by saying, you know, how special this is to me and really how grateful I am because I honestly owe my entire career to you and I don't say that lightly. Like you're the first dude that gave me a shot, that gave me a chance when you were just a, a young buck in Hollywood building your your little management company and I came on board and you know you, you gave me a fucking shot, man. And it's like, it's just so rad to see where we've both gone since then. So I just wanna kick this off with a boatload of gratitude for you because I, I truly am in debt to you and your generosity. I don't know how I respond to that other than, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, very flattered, obviously. Um, you know, I think my entire career has been built around betting on things. Um, and, you know, there's very few sure bets, especially when you're promoting shows. But bringing you on to the management company was like, that was an easy decision. That wasn't, that was a pretty sure bet that you, you had a, you had a lot of good insight and you were very hungry and excited to to get to work and that's what i was excited about and obviously your energy that you haven't lost any of it i feel like i, I the older i get the lo more I, energy i lose you still somehow are gaining more energy day by day so kudos to you but um yeah i got i got nothing but great things to say about you and i look back at those times fondly thanks brother yeah i'm i'm doing a fucking benjamin button dude like I, I've, I've, gone, I've gone through my waves you know being like oh my god i'm getting old and then it's like i don't know where i hit my like my late 30s and i was like i seriously feel like i'm getting younger i seriously feel like i'm getting more excited i have more energy everyone's like bro you don't look like you're 38 you know i feel like i'm, I'm doing my little uh face routine in the morning put my moisturizer on there like you we're go. staying young out here <laughs> yeah man i mean you look at like generation generation right and i feel like women in their 60s and men in their 60s now you're like dude how is that guy 60 he looks 30 and i think as you know longevity manipulation continues to happen and things yeah. we're able to do and a lot of it really comes down to exercise and working out and diet but like there's we're all I, I'm, I'm on the same journey as you know i'm like so dedicated to you know trying to be here as long as possible but um, yeah man dude it, it really what hit me was when i was doing crossfit and, you know, I kind of started a little bit late. Like I was already, you know, my in my 30s, like my early 30s um, compared to when some people start that from like a competitive perspective. But I would go to class and there would be dudes that were like 50, 51, 52. 
and they would fuck me up. I had 20 years on them, but they were kicking my ass. They were lifting more weight. They were doing it faster. They were beating me. And that's when I realized, I was like, yo, this age ain't nothing but a number. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Like, you take 100%. care of yourself, and you have the right mindset, so. Yeah, that's just it. I'd love for us to start off sharing a bit about your career, because you've had such a cool journey, and like I was saying, you know, you've played a lot of different roles, so I'd love for you to walk people through what are some of those roles that you played? I know that we met when you were a promoter. You guys were throwing shows at Control. Definitely want to talk about Control, but what were you doing before Control? Because I think you started in like the fashion space, didn't you? Yeah. So um, before Control, I started as I started at a, a clothing brand called Carbon Robot, and I started as an intern there and worked my way up as sales manager. Then I was doing a lot of the marketing quickly realized like there was a lot of synergy between music and, um, and what we were doing from a fashion perspective, the owners were really invested in, they loved music. Obviously we were owned by a, a music merchandise company. So there was already that connection. We had a lot of bands that we would just give clothes to, to get them to wear Skrillex when he was from first to last Skrillex yeah. was you know, he, he would come in and, and wear our stuff. And we were like, holy shit, like this kid, even before the Skrillex days, he'd wear our clothes and we would immediately sell out of this one hoodie that we made just from him wearing it. This is like MySpace days, by the way. So this is like pre-Facebook, pre any of that. And we're like, oh my God, like this could really be something. e was barely even a thing. These guys actually, it was the first time I went to Coachella back in 2006, I think, was with these guys who had kind of taken me under their wing and brought me in and, and showed me the ropes of marketing. And from there, I, you know, I, I, I parlayed that into, I had moved to LA initially from Orange County to kind of expand the marketing prowess of, of what I was doing for the brand. You can only do so much in Orange County at the time and I wanted to meet people. And so kind of moved to LA and just forced my hand a little bit. Obviously it's a lot, much faster pace in OC. Um, and when I moved to LA, I, I started doing events we did some stuff in Orange County. We had this event called Made You Look where we had built booked Steve Aoki and Africa Bambata and this little tiny bar. Uh, it was called Detroit Bar. And then from there, we started doing events in LA and this little grimy club in, in Hollywood and booking some artists. And then that turned into control. And then I kind of had to make a decision after about a year in LA, I think, or two years in LA, I want to say. I just made the decision. I was like, I'm going to full time just go into the music thing and just focus my efforts on this and, you know, be intentional is what I talk about all the time. Um, being really intentional with, with what I was trying to do and where I wanted to go with my career. And at that time, music, I, I'd fallen in love with it and really wanted to get involved. So just to pick up on a little mindset thing here, cause this is the headliner mindset. Yeah. It sounds like when you were in orange County, like you, you made that move to LA, like, you were wanting a little bit more action, wanting to chase something bigger. Is that accurate to say? A hundred percent. Orange County, like I, I'm back in Orange County now. I started having babies and needed to be closer to Papa and Grandma, right? So, and I love OC and I love what it is. And I think it makes sense at, at, at this juncture in my life. But at the time, LA, like I loved going to LA and it was just so much faster paced. It's where everything was happening. The music industry was there. All the connections that I wanted to make, all the relationships that I wanted to make, I had done so many things in Orange County and we had a really wildly successful monthly event at this little bar where we were selling it out. But I felt like at the time, if I wanted to really get it, the, the clothing brand into the hands of these huge artists in different areas that we weren't able to do, LA was going to be the place. And I was like spot on. As soon as I moved to LA, you could tell like the energy, how fast it was. It was night and day. It was just a completely yeah. different atmosphere and because everyone else around you was moving quickly you were either catching up or, or you're getting on the bus or you're getting off like everyone else is moving at that same speed that was in your lane and it was it was massively important to just be in that energy and be in that scene so then you went all in on throwing shows and being a promoter you left the merch thing that was really lighting you up at that time yeah, it, it was. And it was a tough decision because, you know, I, I said I was I, I started as an intern for that company. I, I worked for free. I grinded for four months just to prove that I could do that. And I had been with them for five years. And so it was it was just the, the mindset of, 
if you're talking about mindsets, it was a mindset of, I'll do whatever it takes to make this work. I'll do whatever I can do to make it work. And then once I really got into it and we had started control right around this time of when I was leaving the the clothing company, I was like, I, I, this is something, this is real. And I, I'd started managing artists. I think that was right around the time when, when we started working together. And it was like, okay, I can do this. I can just do this. Like financially, like it's going to be a hit in the beginning. There's that guaranteed W2 is gone. It's we're on the 1099 plan now. So we're not getting uh we're not getting that steady paycheck or the insurance benefits or any of those things. But like I needed to kind of cut the cord and focus on it's funny because it wasn't focusing on one thing. It was from focusing on control, but also focusing on the the management company and really kind of seeing where that would take me. Yeah, but that's also a big scary moment and decision to make of, hey, I'm going to leave behind that paycheck every other week and really go out on your own and be an entrepreneur. You were throwing your own shows, starting your own management company. What really helped you make that decision? Because I think there's a lot of people that are kind of sitting at that fork in the road. You know, it's scary to leave the fucking job, right? So yeah. What, what really helped you actually take that leap of faith? Well, I think it was a little bit of a cheat code, right? Because control was starting to make money. We were doing shows and making a little bit of money here and there where like I could, it wasn't a, it wasn't a cold, like, you know, it wasn't chop. Like we're just, yeah. we're just moving into this and let's see yeah. what happens. I had it like, I had some sense. Yeah. There was, there was irons in the fire. There were some things that were working already and there was a little bit of money being made and it was like, I'm going to take a hit in the short term, but long term, I believe that this is going to be an absolute game changer for, for what I want to do. And like I'm I'm doing this at 50% right now, right? Because I have this other gig that I'm driving all the way back to Long Beach every single day from LA. I'm just going to fully commit. And like, what does this look like if it's 100% of my focus? You know? Yeah, but yeah. It was, a, it was the same thing for me with coaching. I was coaching part-time for two years. And it was like, okay, I'm making an extra couple hundred bucks. And then I'm like making an extra couple thousand bucks. It's like, all right, but where's that moment, right? Mm -hmm. of, all right, it's we're going to go all point, in. Right? It's such an interesting, it's an interesting moment. I think every artist kind of gets to that moment too of, all right, I'm getting some shows. I'm making some money. I still got the 40 hour a week job though. When's that moment to like really send it and go for it. And I mean, there's always going to be an element of leap and the net will appear, right? Jump off the cliff and trust that like things are going to work out. But also like you said, yeah, make sure... <laughs> you're also jumping into something. There is at least a little bit of momentum going there. If you just started producing six months ago, please don't quit your fucking day job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, I think there's plenty of viral TikTok clips or Instagram clips that'll tell you to just, like, you gotta just commit fully. I, I'm not gonna tell people that only because, like, for me, it was, I was able to kind of see and, like, do both. Plus, like, you know, the other thing that we're not saying here is, the clothing company, because I was able to gift artists and and like bring value to them, I think it was a bridge for me too for a while. Like I could, it was an opener of I could, uh, you know, the Carpet Girl. I was sponsoring some of the early control shows and sponsoring these shows in OC, so they were harmoniously intertwined. Where I could use one, and I, I I'm like a serial you. Know, you know, oh, well, how do we bring this brand into this activation? Like that's, I still do that stuff today. And at the time I felt like that was really something that would make it easier for me to, you know, combine these two things. And eventually it was like, okay, well, you just got to focus on this and like really yeah. go for it. Like you said. And so this brings yeah. us to control, which was such a freaking, you know, just landmark event in the dance music history, honestly, you know, this is this is where we met. Little little sidebar. I was working at Capitol Records at the time. I had the Capitol Records email address. I wanted to get into management, and my intern had found this guy Dallas K on oh, SoundCloud, yeah. and I reached out to him from my Capitol Records email address, like, "Hey, bro, like I'm a manager, <laughs> you know, like nice I got work. this shit going on. I didn't have shit going on at all." But uh, convinced him to work with me. I think we officially worked together for like a month. But during that month, I got him booked. Uh, literally right across the street from Capitol Records was Avalon Hollywood. And you guys were throwing the weekly Friday night party there. So I got I got Dallas booked. I remember meeting you in the green room and just kind of mm -hmm. like mentioned something about like, yeah, I got a management company. And I was like, I'm trying to be a manager. And so that was that was how it all happened. 
but let's talk about that party because it was a it was a special party. You guys were doing something different. You guys were really like a step ahead of the music that was coming. I feel like you guys were really tastemakers and really just had your finger on the pulse of like the new waves of music. You know, you were the first ones to book the Skrillexes and the Dylan Francis and the DJ Snake, you know, all these guys that weren't really playing yet. So how did you know what was cool and what was coming? That's my question. Because you guys, that's like what made Control special. You guys had like a, uh, like a crystal ball that you just knew what the next wave was. Yeah, I mean, it was... Um... It was interesting because at the time, the Saturdays, and I, I loved, I loved uh, Steve Angelo, and I'm sure we'll come back to that point later. And the Progressive House, and I know that was your first love too. That was a lot of the stuff that I really liked, as far as dance music went at that time. And the Saturdays was just a massive thing that was happening at Avalon. It was Avalon Saturdays, and it was John Digweed, and then Axwell, and then Sebastian Ingrosso another week, and it was just sold out massive progressive house techno and it was actually kobe uh was doing those back in the day on the saturdays so when we came in there was this um my partner was a dj and he would dj some of these parties and then that were that we were getting that he was getting booked for and it was this omg brand and it was just like pop it was almost like lmfao and things like that and it wasn't really working. They were trying to do a Hollywood in this big theater, right? And it, and it was like, you know, at a time when Hollywood was doing the tens of thousands of dollars of bottle service. It's 2008. So this is like right before the recession happened, like into 2008. And then what we realized like quickly was if we, the progressive house thing, and this, this is working really well on the Saturdays, but we were going out to Cinespace on Tuesdays and Banana Split on Sundays. And it was like, okay, there's this really crazy underground thing happening where these really dope artists it's almost i loved it because i love metal and 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 rock and i think that's also where you and i bonded um yeah yeah Has and there was that that punk ethos there was yeah, a punk ethos to it it was yeah, like it was edgy. yeah there was like uh you know bands like does it offend you yeah and then there was things like bloody bloody beat roots and justice and like all this stuff was like this is metal this is this is not <laughs> This is not yeah. Progressive House. I love Progressive House. Don't get me wrong, but this is a very different thing that's coming. And it's filling these little rooms. Like Cinespace is 300 people, really probably 200 legally. You know, it was a really tiny space and they're packing it out with these like crazy artists that sound nothing like Progressive House. So at the time it was like, well, this movement's coming and like the LMFAL thing, you're going to run out of artists like that to book on a Friday. They, there's just, there's not something you can do weekly with that kind of sound. So we came in and we changed the name to Control and we leaned straight into doing just that. Just like we're going to go after, I think the first party we ever did was Felix Cartal. Then we had, um, you know, we had months of it not working and, and you know, kudos to the, the owner of Avalon who believed in what we were doing and realized like a lot of club promoters and a lot of owners of venues, you have a couple nights that, that don't make money or that shit the bed or they break even or they lose a little and they're they're they don't have the patience to stick with it we stuck with like winners and losers were they funding like were they helping pay for town or was that all on you guys like how did that work the other events we did we uh, there was many times where we went to the atm if it was a bad night went to the atm after the night to pay the artist in the control situation we had we had set this up a little differently it was a little bit bigger a little bit bigger and we had set it up in a way that we had like a, a co-promotion deal but they they had covered the cost on Got on it. booking artists yeah we had but very that, small that, budgets in the early day though we didn't get these like 20 30 40 50 thousand dollar budgets straight out. we had to prove it with a two to three to five thousand dollar axed first before yeah. we could even have that conversation and that room is not a small room though you're talking about cinespace and this you know two two to three hundred cap shows that were happening but what that was like uh, avalon's like 1500 yeah like legally it was 1500 i think we put it we squeezed <laughs> a couple more bodies in there in the early days For sure i think the actual number is probably around 1500 yeah so you're talking about like going in at seven eight x the capacity at where this music was really hitting in la and yeah i mean you know we we just we really believed in what it was and what it was going to be. And, you know, that first party with Felix Cartal, I don't know that we sold more than three, 400 tickets. So it, 
was a little scary in the beginning because it was the marker in the initial was, oh, maybe this really is all that it can do. Maybe it really is only, only under, it's still very underground and we're a little too early, but we stuck with it. And I think it was around February or March. So like three, we started in December. So three months in, we landed a track and a track was like, that kind of changed the trajectory of the entire event because it was, we sold it out and then some, it was, you know, 2000 people through the doors throughout the night, something like that. It was like, okay, okay. Nerves are yeah. settled. The owner of the venue really sees the vision. We yeah. see that there are two, 3000 kids that are into this music per week that, that will show up. Yeah. I think there's a big lesson in that in, you know, trusting your instinct, but then also sticking with it, you know, even if you don't see the results right away, it can be easy yeah. to pivot and think, oh, well, this isn't working. You know, maybe this sound I'm making isn't popping off. Right. But if in your heart, you know, like, no, this is this is it. I fuck with this. I'm passionate about this. I know there's something here like you really trusted yourselves um, and it but it didn't happen right away. Yeah. So you had to kind of be in that that space of the unknown for a little bit and really trust your instinct. Get comfortable in the uncomfortable, right? It's like getting yourself in these moments and uh, where it's not going to happen overnight. It's just not. We live in this vacuum now with social media where you see the, the artist that gets all the, the accreditation and like, oh my God, they blew up overnight. The song had a billion streams and it's like, that's not realistic. I mean, there is one of those, but for every one of those, there's a hundred thousand of the other side of the thing, right? So... I have this running rule in, in, with it, with me and the companies that I've done, all the different ventures and things I've done. It's like, if you can do something for in my world, for business-wise, if you make it to the five-year mark, you've made something. You've really yeah. made something that is tangible, that it can exist in a marketplace that really exists. Just making it to a year, like I don't have the percentages offhand, but you know the percentages of how many businesses fail in the first year. So just making yeah. it to that first year is already a milestone. Getting to five means that you've made something and it's and it's got some staying power. And with artists, I feel like a lot of times artists will get caught up in this, oh my God, I, I, I have to make this sound because this is what's popping right now. And it's like, if you're starting to make that sound because that's what's going on right now, you're already too late. You yeah. have to make something that sounds authentic to you, that you feel like has staying power. Because if not, you're just going to be chasing trends, and it's not really going to help you in the long run. And and I I can definitely as a as a business owner myself that's in his I think sixth maybe coming on set. It's like this has been the the year that it's starting to click. Yeah. It took me fucking five years to figure this shit out, and like you know get clear and like hey who am I serving? What am I doing? How does this business work? I didn't know what the fuck I was doing for the first five years, and now it's like okay, it's finally starting to click. You know, and that's something I emphasize so much on this podcast is like, yes, you're an artist. First and foremost, you need to be an artist and make art, but like, you're also a business owner and these same, yeah. I don't care what industry you're in, all these same business principles really apply. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're saying that. And, uh, with this particular business control, you guys ran that for like 12 years about <laughs> weekly parties every single Friday night for how many I think years? It was, like, oh, I think it was 10 we never 10? got to do a 10 year anniversary, unfortunately, but we did 10 and then COVID was kind of the nail in the coffin. When COVID happened, we were, yeah. we were yeah, yeah. kind of officially, you know, on hiatus. That's insane. That's wild. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to run a little podcast every week. You, know, <laughs> you guys are throwing fucking 2000 person shows every weekend, right? Quite an operation. I have two questions around, uh, around that for you. One, what would you say was the biggest business lesson or just lesson in general that you learned from control 10 years of throwing that party? It's a great question. Well, I guess the biggest one was it was, it really was the first lesson for me and like what we were just talking about. It was, you have to trust your instincts and you have to have convictions in what you're doing in the sense that you need to stick things out, even if they're not working. Because, you know, we're coming off of an event that didn't work, that we just did for nine months in a small, really small room uh, in Hollywood that really didn't work. I mean, we were getting our friends there, but we weren't getting the general public there. So we're coming off of a room that held 
180 people and we're trying to book things and it was like our friends showing up no one really wants to pay a cover like no one wants to do anything like most of the bar tab is me so like there wasn't <laughs> there wasn't really it was like okay is this a second time this isn't gonna work and you know yeah. that a-track show is three four months into it and we're like oh no no this is this is real it was four months i think it was march so it was like four months but we went through three months of like, okay, this show, maybe it sold 600 tickets. Maybe we broke even. Maybe we only lost a thousand bucks this night. Okay, maybe we did this. And then, you know, we had those like one marker of success. And like, I think where this translates for, for artists, which is your listeners, is like, you can trust in like one little thing that that works for you and leaning into the things that you're good at and and the things that you know and the things you have access to is like always what we, what we did. No, well, always what I've done with anything I've done is like, Believe in the things that you have at your disposal. And those are like your your first indicators of how can I how can I make money off of this thing like you? Like your coaching business, you're relying on those these relationships that you've built over the last 15, 20 years in music to then apply that to this new venture. And people that love and trust that you've done right by them, I'm sure we're like, of course this makes sense. Totally. Definitely do that. You know, I'll definitely call this guy when I need that. So that's a great point, is it's been not only the last five, you know, six years of running this business, but it was the 10 years of building relationships before that also that contributed to the success of the business. I mean, there's this great saying is like in creative and we'll get, I know we'll get to the creative agency at the end, but there's this yeah. great thing of, um, and it's, and it just holds tr so true. And it's exactly what you're saying of, you know, someone says, well, why does this logo cost $5,000? You took you 30 minutes to make. And it's like, no, no, no. It took me 40 years and 30 minutes to make because yeah. it's based on all of my experience, all of my life lessons and all of my relationships, all of that stuff to get to this point is what you're yeah. paying for. You're not paying yeah. for the time. I'm able to make that or I'm able to do that thing. I'm able to coach, give you a, a session in an hour because of every book I read, every experience I had, every single aspect that I took to get here for you to even trust me with that part of what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thousand percent, man. Beautifully said. My second question around control was, I mean, you saw and helped countless artists over those 10 years. You know, a lot of them that started in the side room and then went on to become the fucking biggest DJs in the world, right? Like you've seen a lot of artists go from zero to a hundred. What would you say are some of the top qualities and characteristics from those artists that like came through and really popped off? Well, you're talking about the side room, right? Like Skrillex played the side room first. Obviously, we don't have to talk about his trajectory and where he is today, but he was completely different animal. Like there was just, his sound was different. I mean, before Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites, like before all of that stuff, like it was different. It was just like, there wasn't anything that sounded like that. Dylan Francis, another guy that played the side room. Dylan had this, the Moombaton sound, like it didn't exist, basically. There was this, it was a completely different thing. And you're talking about like everything else we're talking about here. Like those are two guys who trusted that what they were doing was the right thing. And it was way different, but they knew that if they made it and did it, that they hoped that people would like it, right? But they believed in it, they trusted in it, and they thought it. Yeah. I think that like, to be fair, like what was with Skrillex, like before that, he had a project called Sunny Sound where he was singing on it. It was electronic, but it was like his testing ground. He didn't get to Skrillex like, oh, I'm just going to do this. Like he, he, he tested, he like beta tested with this, with this other thing yeah. that didn't work. And then he was able to, okay, I'm going to do this. And then it turned into something. So I think to answer that question in a more <laughs> long roundabout way here is um, the artist that like, really believed in what they were doing the artists that like knew that it mattered to them what they were doing and they were making it for themselves and like the goal was to get obviously commercial success but they believed in it so much that why wouldn't someone else believe in what they were doing yeah that's it's an important nuance i think is it's like you can try to make something unique because you're trying to be successful because you're trying to like outsmart the competition, but it's not actually coming from the same place as when you're making it from the perspective of like, I fuck with this so hard, you know, like, and, and it's just that real 
deep, deep, genuine lane of authentic self-expression as an artist, which those guys were definitely doing. Yeah, it was it was for them. They made it for them, and they knew that they believed in it so much. And it's like everything that I've done in my career is the same same mindset, right? It's like I believed in what I was doing. It's weird that you don't. And if you don't believe in what I'm doing, that's okay, because I do. That energy and the way that I speak about what I'm doing, whether it's control or the agency now or anything that I've ever done, I believe in it. If you don't, that's on you. And that was kind of like the, the energy that I bring into everything. And you can tell when people have those convictions in their music or what they're doing, they believe in it. And then like you almost question, I've never heard anything like this before, but that guy seems to know and think that this is dope. So yeah, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, you're almost yeah. changing people's minds with, with your mindset. Yeah, love that. Yeah. And so I want to dive into Super Evil Genius Core and talk about the creative agency. Before we get there, though, there is there was another piece of your story that was really cool, which is that you were, I think, was it the manager, the GM of Size Records, Steve Angelo's label, for a little bit? Yeah, I was the label right. manager for, for, for Size for about 18 months, for about a year and a half. Yeah. At the time, I was, I think I had six clients on the management roster, couple that were doing really yeah. well. You know, Mac J was at the peak of his powers at that point and yep. had five other artists and still doing control and got asked by uh, his his manager at the time was a good friend of mine, Seb Weber. And he said, Steve's looking to open an LA office and he wants to, he's interviewing managers. I think you should apply for this. And Steve and I hit it off and it, and it turned into something that like i it was, I still can't believe I was doing all four of those things at the same time yeah. when I look back at it, but I wouldn't change it for anything. It was like that guy, I think Steve really influenced where I wanted to go when we started this agency was just the way he approached creative and the way he approached his craft was second to none. And he's just such an innovator and it was really cool to work under someone, especially because coming off of control and management, like I had been kind of on my own, like running these companies in a way, like I had a partner in one of those that, that we bounced ideas off each other, but I hadn't worked for anyone in a while. So like being able to work for someone and see his vision for it and like how he would do things, it was a really cool, like stop, you know, bus stop on the, on the, the road to be able to kind of see what he was doing and how he approached his craft. It was like, oh shit, okay, this is another level. I can really apply some of this. I, I felt like I was getting like re-educated, so to speak, at that time. It was really cool. That's super cool to hear, and, and it really makes sense. I'm curious about how working with Steve at size and seeing his, as you say, just like his approach to creative, like how did that influence and impact you in the way that, you do things. So the amazing thing about size at this time is Steve owned a creative agency and the creative agency was attached to the label. So when wow. we signed a record, we would send the record off, we'd send the file over and they'd make the artwork. So all of that, that artwork. And if you remember, it was, it was like way ahead. Super cool. Every, oh, it was really yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Super and cool shit. They were making visualizers and all this stuff. And it was all being done. This is 2013, remind, mind you. Like, this yeah, is 2013. Ago, yeah, this is a long yeah. time ago. So there's this a creative agency attached. So it was like, I'm working with these phenomenal creatives. This guy, he's actually in Sweden now. And he's working for a creative agency doing some really big projects. I connected with him recently. They were doing all of the creative. So it was like this entire ecosystem. And being a part of that was like, okay creative agency for the music industry. Brilliant. Yeah. How do we like, yeah. and at the time I, they weren't doing a whole lot of music based projects. They had some other things, but I think size obviously being the, and Steve, like working with Steve, those are the big ones. But I was like, okay, that yeah. kind of just like this, maybe this is something. And then, you know, fast forward a little bit down the road, things really changed. That's so cool, man. It, it sounds like that. It, it all starts to make sense now. I can see how that was an inspiration to really like step into the creative agency world yourself and get a good uh, kind of masterclass. And that's so cool. I, I hadn't really thought about that, you know, but 
you know, now I think it is we are living in such a visual content era where it is about Instagram and TikTok. And we know that like it's about so much more than just the music. But 10 years ago, it wasn't, right? 10 years ago, it was a totally different landscape. So mm-hmm. to see that they were really emphasizing that, like, hey, when we put out music, we also got to put out really cool visual content and do yeah. it in like a progressive way that's pushing boundaries. And it's it's this other this other lane of art that a lot of people are just missing out on, right? Just doing the sonic side of it, but not doing the visual side of it. But yeah, guys like Steve Angelo and you know, obviously a handful of other bigger artists were as well. So that's super cool. Totally makes sense. So now you are the founder, the CEO running a creative agency yourself. Let's talk about Super Evil, which first off, I think is just the coolest fucking name in the world. Uh, It's so rad. (laughs) It's so good. What is it exactly that you guys do as a creative agency? So we actually started as a social media digital marketing agency. My partner, Colby Rice, he came from Live Nation doing marketing and overseeing the budgets of hard. And we started it in like a little corner of another agency I was a part of at the time. And we sat in the corner and we were like, we're going to build this this marketing department. We're going to do social and, and marketing, which is, again, going all the way back. Marketing was the stuff I really enjoyed. And he's just really intelligent and really sees things differently as far as uh, social media and how all that goes. And like when he came over, he had clients. So he had a few clients and, you know, quickly we realized like, okay, we need to like full services because at the time we were doing social and marketing, but back to the, what we were saying earlier is like, we get handed creative and if the creative wasn't good, you can't market it. So we're yeah. trying to market yeah, creative, yeah. and if the creative is not good, we we can't market this. We can't sell it, and, and who's on the hook if it doesn't sell? It's like, and let's break this down real quick, just so that everybody really, really understands what is the difference when you say creative versus social versus marketing, right? Like, what does yeah. that actually mean? So it's a great question. So, marketing and social, meaning we would do we we do currently we offer services where we manage your social media pages, we're posting the content. And because we're a creative agency, we can create that content, not just post it. And that's organic posting, that's boosting posts and running ads, both both uh, natively to platform. We can run Facebook ad campaigns. We work with not just artists now, but we work with, we have seven music festivals under, under uh, contract currently, where we're kind of overseeing and working on big marketing budgets for them. I guess the easiest way to put it is, if, if an artist came to us or a brand came to us, we can build the brand from scratch. We can build everything. And then once it's ready to go to market, we can then run the social media. We can run the marketing campaigns. We could do the digital marketing and the ad buying behind all of that. And then most our most recent addition last year was we added PR and comms. So that's a social PR aspect where we're running behind the scenes, like feeding our own content to these other pages that are like-minded. There's all these techno pages that I'm sure everyone pops up in everyone's feed that are posting these crazy things. Like you can see all of that. So there's a lot of, a lot of that. So it's, it's, it's three tiered now where it's ideation creation, and then we're actually marketing it and putting it out there and putting the strategy behind it and then running the ads and everything else behind it to like really make it go far. Yeah. So really, really a full service. And this sounds, I know so many artists are getting so excited at just imagining this dream reality and possibility where somebody else just handles all of the social media for them. <laughs> Cause I know so many artists are like, yo, I just want to make the fucking music. Yeah. And it would be so cool if somebody else did the rest of this for me. Right. Yeah. I would, um, it's not possible. So like, I'll just cut that right there, which I think is what you're, you're, you're leading you're leading me into this this answer, but you still can't just completely absolve yourself from that uh, yeah. that part of the business, right? Like we can, I think the easiest way to put it is like, we can speak for you, but ultimately we need to have the parameters of what that means. Like we need to understand your voice, the vision, like the brand, like we have to speak to something in a way that makes sense. So we're still hopping on a weekly or a bi-weekly call. And, and we're doing this stuff for you and we're, we're, we're getting approvals. This is, you know, we have to sound like you on social media too. Like we've had people tell us, I don't like that emoji. Like, you know, so we have people <laughs> who are very particular about the way they sound on social and the things they post. 
So on the one hand, yes, absolutely. We can definitely post for you. We can come up with strategy, but ultimately you're the one out there as that artist. So if we're speaking for you online, I mean, like until someone goes and actually sees you play, like they're more likely to catch you online or catch you on social than they are to see you play, right? So like we have to make sure that that voice aligns with who you are. We make yeah. you into this like crazy thing and then you have to go out and, and live that. That's going to be difficult if that's not who you genuinely are inside. And yeah. artists, like we do branding too for brands. So we have cannabis brands, we have alcohol brands, we've done product brands. The artist projects are so different because we're creating a brand for a person. Yeah, it's an alter ego for an artist, but it is them. And, and yeah, it's not the same as doing a cannabis brand. Like we can make it look dope and all this stuff, but like it's not a human being that we're making this brand for. We're making it for an actual product. So it needs yeah. to be cool and feel like something unique, but it's they're not the same thing. It's like it's a very personal experience for an artist versus versus a product. Yeah, 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 totally. What do you think artists don't like really understand when it comes to this process of building your brand, putting out content, like really building a proper artist project? Where do you think some of the like missing gaps are for people? I think it's like you just said, where you have artists frothing at the the thought that they don't have to do this anymore, or like they can get away with this. It's unfortunately, fortunately, however you want to look at it, it is a part of the way music works. Music's still a business and it is a part of the process. And if you want to just make music, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because I'm saying this out of both sides of my mouth, because as an agency, like there's graphic design and there's art, right? Like, and we're making art, graphic design is we're making art for somebody else. Whereas like you can make art for yourself. And if it goes out into the universe and you know, a hundred people stream it and you're cool with that, then that's awesome. Then that, that is, that that's great for you. But if you're trying to have a career in music and you're playing into the commerce aspect that is the music industry, then it does require, um, it requires this as the marketing arm of what you're doing. It requires someone to really be thinking from a strategic standpoint. And it's really easy to see. And like, you can go down the list of the most popular artists that are happening if you want to just look at the three biggest artists in dance music that have popped up in the last year, year and a half, last, we'll say two, two, three years, it's John Summit, who we work with, Dom Dalla, and Fred again. I'm not doing those in any particular order because I'm not playing that game, but those are the three that have really become superstars. Yeah. And if you really dig in and see what they're doing on social, what they're doing creatively, what they're doing from a marketing perspective. All of them are doing very different things, by the way, but they're all yeah. playing that game. And they're all yeah. incredibly good at social. They're all incredibly good at the way they speak to their audience. They know their audience. They know the way they want to act. It's not like I woke up and what do I tweet today? You know, it's not that mentality at all. It's, it's all very thought out. It's all part of their process. Yeah. And it's something that is that is a huge part of what we're doing here and um, and where we're going. Yeah. I totally forgot that you guys work with John Summit and that's probably the most common name that I hear come up when I'm like talking with clients and artists or whatever. They're like, oh, like, like he just comes up, even if like you don't like his music, or you don't like his brand or whatever, everybody uses him as an example because it's been just such a fucking home run, you know, it's just like mm -hmm. all of the planets have aligned and he's really, uh, he's really blown up. So what has that looked like? working with him what is it what is it exactly that you guys have helped him with and maybe we could break down a little bit of that strategy sure so almost three years ago now two years two years ago sorry it's about two years ago a little over two years ago they came to us because he wanted to start a record label which at the time was off the grid and we built the record label branding we did all the branding for it so came up with the name with him we worked on it together we built this like really incredible brand ideation and there's this same thing as the size going back to the size thing is like there's this synergy between all the releases all the releases feel like an off the grid release and you know obviously that's changed and it's turned into experts only which is the newest version of, of what he's doing but we've been doing to answer your question we've been doing his creative direction on the record label side for experts only uh, we've helped with merch design merch production on a lot of his uh, graphics um, we've done 
various graphics. We've done billboard design. We did the billboard for him in LA and then a couple other things. We do a lot of his tour poster design too. So we did the BMO poster when he played in LA. We just did the Madison Square Garden poster design. We've done a bunch of stuff for him. And he's been a real pleasure to work with him and his team. Like I can't say enough good things about their team. They're they're awesome and they're super, I mean, they're it's just a rocket ship and they're just all like it's at how fast it's grown in the last two even in the last two years when we started with them versus where it is now is insane yeah team's grown uh, uh along the way and you know it's funny it's the agent is the same agent that i worked with a long time ago on some of my artists he's with ben sprit so it's really cool to be able to like see and hang with ben again awesome what are some other success stories that you've had at the agency that you're proud of I won't give you the boring answer, but we've had a, a ton of success. I think there's there's two ways to look at that, right? We've had a lot of success as far as client work and massive things we've done. I mean, we have clients such as Splash House. We're in our third year here with Splash House. We did Desert Air, which is another Golden Voice Festival. We're doing the No Values Festival marketing, which is a festival out in, um, in Pomona. It's all like social distortion like, and misfits. Yeah, and it's, that's like it, metal and shit, right? Yeah, like, metal like and punk. punk. And stuff. Yeah, yeah it's, let's and go. it's awesome. <laughs> so we're doing that one. We have a project called Stern Grove up north. I think a big one for me of, we've been doing, we did the last Porno for Pyros tour, which is uh, Perry Farrell's band, their last tour ever. So we just wrapped wow. that cam- campaign up. We were able to double their social media following in, in five months. We did PR, so we got them a bunch of PR activations, got them on the cover of the LA Times, all kinds of amazing stuff, and really kind of helped navigate the the marketing waters on that one. That was a really cool one for me because it was a band I grew up listening to. We work with the band Bush and Gavin Rossdale, which Dude, is like bands legends. I was, yes, yeah. band I was like, I you know, I fell in love with in like seventh grade. So there's been some really cool projects that we currently have. I think if I had to go back, only I, I think as we, Fisher is a huge one that we worked with two, three years ago for about a year and a half. Chris Lake and Black Book, um, that was such a huge one. I think, you know, I talked earlier a little bit about like, you know, leaning into the things that you have at your disposal and the, the, the resources you have that are available to you. The big thing for me when we were managing together was I didn't know what I was doing. I was kind of figuring out as I went and like yeah. learning and what I would might, the thing I would do is I would buy someone dinner or lunch like hey dude can we go to lunch i'll buy you lunch and i would use that hour hour and a half to just pick their brain on what they were doing and how i could implement that into what i was doing and it was the best 20 to 50 dollars i ever spent because it was like i was getting a a class and how do i figure these things out so i think with all of that like after all that time like all of those people and then i would book their artists if it was a manager i would do all of that so fast forward till now and and to what we were doing it was like we had done i had done a lot of really nice things like i'd you know booked people in the early days of control that you know maybe no one had heard of him i mean like don diablo is a guy that we booked several times that like you know in the early days and like it was a no-brainer for him when he wanted to do this event when everyone else came knocking at his door it was a no-brainer for him to come play for us at that yeah. point because it was like yeah you guys want me now, but these are the only guys that were willing to book me when I wasn't worth the tickets that I'm worth now. So like yeah. doing those types of favors in the early days really paid dividends to the agency too, because, you know, Chris Lake said something to me, uh, which was really sweet in the early days, which was, you know, of course you're doing this. Like, of course you're doing this. <laughs> this yeah. makes total sense in life. Yeah. It was such a nice thing to say that he, that he had trusted because he had, you know, seen other things that I'd done in other parts of my career. And it was like, they wanted to reimagine the Black Book label. And, you know, that was like a huge jumping off point for us on the creative side. And yeah. it won us Fisher and it won us John Summit and it won us all these different things. And I, I am so grateful to to that team because they didn't have to bet on on me in this venture. It was a new venture. It was completely different from anything else I'd ever done. And they were willing to bet on me and what I was doing. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm eternally grateful for, for that because it's really like helped turn the agency into what it is today. We have 20 clients currently we have a we have a massive roster and it's all it's a bunch of different things and a bunch of different arenas and you know but it started with that uh that tipping point moment yeah man you know uh, as they say your network is your net worth and uh, you know i don't necessarily love that term because (laughs) you know it's more about like 
that deeper level of networking is building friendships. We want to work with our friends, you know, and you've, you've, you've been a master at that. You know, you've been planting seeds and developing real relationships, real friendships for 10, 15, I don't know, almost, probably almost 20 years now, right? And getting to see them come to fruition is, is so cool and so beautiful. And, you know, same thing with me, you know, for seven years working at Icon, all I did was just help people for fucking seven years. Yeah. And so now and you didn't it's ask like, for anything. No, no, it's all. It there all, was no all expectation of, oh, no. I'm going to get you later, right? That was, yeah, that, that's not the at huge, all. That's a huge not point here. It's not like, do a bunch of nice things and like eventually you'll expect to get something back. It was yeah, like, no, there yeah. was no expectation. Yeah. It's genuine, man. It's genuine. And it is, you know, I, I, I get super woo woo on here all the time, but it's like, it's energy. It's like the law of reciprocity. Like, whatever you give is what you're going to receive. If you're giving love, if you're giving good energy, you're putting out good vibes, all that shit's going to come back to you. You don't know how. And it might not come back from even that specific person, but like the universe is going to bring it back to you. You know, it's just karma, really. I also love that you talk about the importance of asking questions because it actually brings up a memory that I, that I share all the time. I was driving with you one day in, uh, in your black Mercedes. I remember you had that, you had that black <laughs> Mercedes and Jake Udell called us and I am like the biggest fan of Jake Udell. I think he is like such, I think he's one of the most like genius managers and entrepreneurs and just business people like in the whole fucking game. But he's the guy behind Cruella. He was behind Zoo, Gallant. Like he launched a lot of great artists. And now he's, I don't know, he's doing like some crazy tech stuff. But anyways, mm-hmm. huge fan of him. But I remember him calling us when he was just a little baby manager. He he was just getting started. And I remember him calling you uh, and, and I think you had the speakerphone on in, in the car and he was just asking questions. He was like, Jason, like, what are these blog things? And like, how do I get, you know, my artist on a blog and who should I talk to? And he was just relentlessly just picking your brain. And it always stuck with me. Cause I was like, Oh, like I just saw him succeed so quickly going from like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing to being like, I'm a powerhouse manager making like millions of dollars with my clients now. And that yep. always stuck with me. Cause I was like, Oh, this, this guy was just asking questions and just picking brains, you know? And it's cool that you bring that up because sometimes I think we're scared to ask stupid questions, you know, or we feel like hesitant because we might look like we don't know what we're talking about. And the truth is, yeah, we fucking don't (laughs) until we start asking questions. You know, it's like the music business is complicated. Ask as many questions as you can, you know? So I I love that you bring that up. And who cares if you don't know? Like, what's the worst? (laughs) I mean, it's kind of like, uh, I always say this, like the worst thing is anything I do, if I reach out to someone is like, or like, you know, we, we place a big bet on like trying to send a proposal to some huge artist or we, we pitch in on some sort of like mass, massive pitch. It's like worst thing that someone's going to tell me is no. And yeah, I can live with that seven days a week. I do not care. Yeah. Like, yeah. okay, no. Okay. You don't want to do it. Yeah. No problem. No problem. And if and yeah. most of the time that stuff actually motivates me, it's like, okay, you said no. What am I doing that they don't view me on this level? Or what am I doing that's, that's, that, that I can be seen in the same context that they're seeing whatever other agencies pitching on this. That's like an internal thing. Is like, I'm going to internalize that and go, okay, well, how do we be better versus, you know, getting mad and frustrated that, well, they don't see me that way. It's like, no, no, no. What kind of self-reflection can I do to be seen on the same level as some of these other agencies or some of these other people so I can be in that conversation? Yeah. That was like huge for me. And also, if you're not getting no's, That's also an indicator that you're doing something wrong and there should be some adjustments made because that shows that you're not asking enough. That shows that you're probably playing it safe on the sidelines and you're not actually, as I would say, in the arena. You should be getting no's. You should be getting rejection because if you're not, you're not playing the fucking game. You're not playing all out, right? Yeah, I 100% agree with you. You talk about the the woo-woo thing is like I'm a huge believer in energy and being intentional with what you're doing um best book i think i we went back and forth on this but principles like is such a great business book i don't care if you're an artist i don't care because there's a personal side there's he talks about his personal principles and he also talks about business principles but he talks about like being transparent radically transparent and being Mm -hmm. intentional with what you're doing and it is so true is like if you're constantly being yourself and being intentional like good things will happen. And like, you know, life's not always going to be sunshine and roses. Like if you don't have those bad moments, those hard moments, if you don't have those moments where you're like, 
is this going to work? Am I going to make it? If you're not having those moments, like you haven't hit that point of like, those are testing moments. Those are, those are the parts of like, those are the big tests. Like, can you continue to push forward? Are you going to take this moment? How do you react in this moment? Because it's really easy for things like, and listen, like we have companies go through times where you lose a client or like something bad happens and you go, wow, instead of complaining, instead of getting mad at that client, instead of like getting frustrated with the way, like, what did we do wrong? How do we be better? How do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And let's take those necessary steps. It's like, I always tell people with this company or with anything, it's like, I can't tell you every single time someone gave me a compliment or every time we we got a win with the agency, but I can sure as shit tell you every single mistake I made that was ex- especially the expensive ones. I can tell you those because those are the painful reminders. Those are the things that are drilled in the back of your head that you will hopefully never make again. You'll learn from those. And those are things that you use to hopefully grow from. And that is such a great example of what I would call the headliner mindset, right? Not falling into victimhood where it's like, oh, poor me. This didn't work out. I got fucked over. Whatever little victim bullshit we want to fall into. Instead, you're like, no, this is a lesson. Every moment of pain is an opportunity for growth. Every fuck up is, a, is an opportunity to learn something and to become better, to become stronger, to become, you know, more seasoned. And that's all perspective. Like you just get to yeah. choose, right? Do you want to be living in ownership or do you want to live in victimhood, right? So it's a great, a great perspective to adopt and to embody. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really everything because it's the same like you're talking about mindset. It's like if you have that mindset that like, you know, this, this didn't work out. No one signed my record. No one wants to sign me to a management deal. In, in that moment, that's that, that inflection point. You can quit in that moment or you can go, okay, what do I need to do differently? Because maybe my, it's my approach. Maybe the way that I've been doing things isn't the right way. Ask those questions. Call those people. Figure those things out. Because a lot of times, especially in today's era, like not to give a hard time to this generation, but a lot of times I feel like people experience like a first no or like a first like, first sign of strife and they go, okay, well, I'm just, I'm not going to do that anymore. Maybe I'll just try something else. And it's like, those are the moments, like they say, what is iron sharpens iron? Like that doesn't happen. You don't do that from like going through the easy moments. That's easy. That's where your character is developed for sure. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, I know that you have had a countless amount of those moments on your journey and have forged an incredible character in the process. And I really couldn't be more honored to have you join us today. And, you know, just one more time and so, so grateful for, you know, just the, the role that you've played on my journey and and the trajectory of my life that you have helped, uh, you know, just, just, get me to where I am today. And uh, it's really, really cool to reconnect with you and just to see where life has taken us, you know, like 10 years yeah. ago, we would, we would have no fucking idea that we would be doing these things, you know? And right? I think so much of it is just like, just keep following the breadcrumbs, right? Follow yeah. the, follow the passion, follow the excitement. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's been a fun journey, man. Really, really good to see you. Great to reconnect with you. And thank you for hopping on today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm super proud of you. I'm stoked on everything you've that you've been able to accomplish. And I love that you've, you've been doing this six years now. You, you cross my, my invisible imaginary line threshold of, <laughs> of five years that makes, that makes things really click and go. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to see that you're doing what you love and, and you, you found your, your, your place where you're crushing it. So that's awesome. And I appreciate the kind words and I have nothing but kind things to say about you. It was a pleasure working with you then. And yeah, I'm stoked to be here and I'd love to, continue this conversation another time <laughs> yeah we'll do we'll do a round two for sure <laughs> appreciate you brother yeah you too man thank you